Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Over the weekend, just one quick update. The Wireshark released a new version, version 4.4, and with that came an interesting new feature. You're now able to convert the Wireshark display filters into BPF capture filters. BPF, short for Berkeley packet filters, is also often just called TCP dump filters because that's where you see them used the most. But really, they're used in a wide range of software, pretty much anything that uses LibPCAP and beyond. Having the ability to convert the Wireshark filter language, the display filter language, into these capture filters is quite useful. Of course, it comes with its limitations. Uh, BPF does not really capture the full range of Wireshark uh, display filters. If Wireshark doesn't have a BPF equivalent uh, for a particular display filter, it will just gray out uh, that option. Have to play with this a little bit and see how far it really goes, but definitely appears to be doing the basics uh, like your ports and uh, IP address and the like. Of course, once you enter the payload, things get a little bit more tricky. And then some things it definitely can't do is things like statefulness, like for example, identifying TCP streams. And I know I have done it and maybe uh, you have run into this uh, yourself that you had some open source project that you tried to make work and well, it uh, didn't quite work for whatever reason, didn't compile or whatever. So you took a look at the GitHub issues and uh, well, you were kind of lucky that someone reported this issue before and then someone else added a comment with a potential fix for the issue, maybe a different version of a library that you needed or such in order to avoid the problem. Well, appears that you have to be a little bit careful with these uh, comments. There are reports now where malicious actors are using comments uh, left for GitHub issues in order to spread malicious code. As so often, uh, GitHub is playing a little bit whack the mole here, trying to eliminate uh, these malicious comments. Uh, but of course, there are always some that haven't been removed yet. They often do just ask the user to download some code and run it. Uh, that code, and of course, turns out to be malware. In particular, the Llama Info Stealer appears to be a popular target for these attacks. This attack, of course, goes somewhat against the collaborative nature of open source software, where it is very common, where you have people jime in with fixes and maybe even offer a fixed download. The other issue here is that apparently anti-malware has had a hard time also alerting on this malicious code. In the last few days, I saw quite a few mentions of a uh, malware that apparently has been named uh, Waldemore. Well, not a big fan of uh, sort of these flashy names for malware. It looks like we're sort of stuck with it. Uh, what's sort of interesting about this malware is not only does it impersonate tax authorities, but it appears to do this on a global scale. So it's not just going after your IRS in the US. And uh, often you see like you know, the revenue office, I think it's called in the UK being targeted uh, with malware, but it appears to be more global, impersonating a large range of different national tax authorities. Also interesting, but has been seen before, is that the malware, once the user installs it, does use uh, Google Sheets in order uh, to set up its command control channel. Cloud services like this are always a favorite uh, among attackers because it's so difficult for defenders uh, to really control access to these services uh, fine-grained enough. And just about a month ago, Jenkins published an arbitrary file read vulnerability. This vulnerability had a uh, pretty high CVSS score for a file read vulnerability 8.8 .8 because, well, uh, this vulnerability could actually be used for remote code execution. And we do now have a proof of concept exploit thanks to a blog post by uh, Conviso. Conviso uh, did release the details how you actually are able uh, to get access uh, to then do remote code execution. The trick here is the agents that are able uh, to connect uh, to Jenkins. 
you're essentially able uh, to circumvent the ancient controller access control system according to the blog post. Well, given that there is no uh, proof of concept exploit, the exploit isn't terribly complex. I hope you all update it. Well, that's it for uh, today. I'll be leaving uh, for Las Vegas uh, tomorrow in order to start teaching the Defending Web Application uh, class on Wednesday. So hope to see some of you there. I'll always have stickers with me. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for liking, subscribing, and recommending this podcast to your friends and enemies. Talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.